the historical roots of the rapidly expanding cult of Mary with the worship of ancient goddesses and other pagan practices have been examined in an earlier chapter. Such links now seem to strengthen what we assumed before, or even proved before. The New Age movement is undoubtedly advancing on many fronts, not least in the Church, which will not endure sound doctrine, having itching ears. Many Christians have drunk deep drafts of New Age potions. For example, holistic health, hypnosis, yoga, inner healing, meditation, psychical research and awareness training, and many have imbibed new doctrines and heresies based on the humanistic and positive thinking of Taylor de Chardin, Norman Vincent Peale and others which provide the church with its emphasis on an earthly kingdom now, the social gospel and society reconstructed for Christianized with kingdom principles for the Lord's return. Restorationist leader Bryn Jones, writing in the beginning of 1991, promised his followers that, quote, by the power of his spirit, we will bring all that is against God and man beneath Christ's authority. God's church will be the most influential body of people on earth in the final period of this age. Unquote. This is indeed a prophetic word, but it is fulfilled in scripture only by the Apostate Church of the Book of Revelation. Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Joggler66, Hour of the Truth. This is a new teaser for a new book, but actually it's more than a teaser. It is reading the prologue, the preface, the introduction and the foreword of a book that, teasing or not, I'm going to read anyway, because I'm going to do a reading of that in German and I'm going to do a reading of that in English, because I hold here the book and that is uh, something new for me. I hold the book in my hands because, you know, rulers of evil, Babylon, mystery, religion, all the other things I was doing, those were always PDF files, books that I found online. This one I actually hold in my hands because a former brother in Christ, Walt Stickle, sent that to me some time ago together with the King James Bible in red letter print for which I'm th still very grateful to have received. And along with that he sent me Code Word Babylon and this book from Michael de Semlian that you've probably heard about called All Roads Lead to Rome. And um, this book I also found in German, and I have the German copy in my hands right now also, and today I did the same reading I'm doing now in English and German, and I will read these two books simultaneously on my YouTube channel, <coughs> process them into videos, and um, put them in the same playlist where you can find all readings. You just have to check if you're whether reading, uh, watching All Roads Lead to Rome or Alle Wege Führen nach Rome, as it is called in German. So I don't think that will be a problem when you're looking for the English one in the playlist. Um, this book from Michael de Semlian has uh, been written by him in 1993, or at least has been published in 1993. Um, and I very much love this book, of course, like always. I haven't read it completely before, just the first few chapters. And uh, when you check one of my recordings on Hour of the Truth some time ago with Walt Stickle, we read chapter 19 about Bible, prof Bible prophecy and Bible versions. But today, as I said, not to make a too long introduction, a too long teaser of it and hold you from the facts, I'm going to read the first part that contains, as I said already, uh, the prologue, preface, introduction and the foreword of the book. I'm going to start with what's written on the back of the book of Michael de Semlian, All Roads Lead to Rome. The illustration on the front cover, <coughs> that you can see, of course, in the pictures in the video, shows Pope John Paul II, a devoted Mariologist, offering incense to Our Lady of Fatima. This same ritual takes place daily at countless shrines all over the world and is an important part of Roman Catholic worship. 
At the same time, many evangelical Christians are being told by their leaders that Catholicism is merely a denomination of the Church of Jesus Christ, and they need to come together with these other Christians in true unity. Biblical truth, for which, for which past believers have laid down their lives in martyrdom, are being compromised or completely eroded in the name of unity. Where is it all heading? And why? Well, let me just explain. As I told you, Michael de Semlian wrote this book in 1993. Today we have the 3rd of September 2016, 23 years later. And where is it all heading and why? <clears throat> When you follow my channel, and especially my readings on Hour of the Truth and the other stuff, you know where it all is leading. To a one world religion, where all the ecumenicals come back to the Church of Rome. That's why the undertitle of the book All Roads Lead to Rome is The Ecumenical Movement. The Ecumenical Movement started with Vatican II in the 1960s and has come to almost completion now in 2013, especially when you hear Pope Francis, who welcomes everyone into the Church of Rome. Gays, atheists, Muslims. Should I really count on? You know it for yourself, right? You know what Pope Francis does. The Antichrist does. So where is it all heading and why? An interesting question. Maybe in 1993, but today we know better. Because already in 1999, on the 31st of October, Reformation Day, the worldwide Lutheran Reformation came back under the wings of Rome with the Joint Declaration of Justification, And five years later, in 2004, the Methodist Worldwide Congregation came back under the wings of Rome, signing the same document. <clears throat> Where is it all heading? And why? This book seeks to explain some of the background to, push, uh, to this push for unity above all else, and urges the reader to contend for the faith and hold fast to a true, biblical and Christ-centered gospel of salvation by faith alone. Just as Tyndale's prayer was, Lord, open the King of England's eyes, so the need today is for the Church to have its eyes open and to watch and pray. That's what it reads from the back cover of the book. I just have to add here, so the need today is for the Church to have its eyes open and to watch and pray we should maybe first define what is the Church, what is the Church of Christ, what is the Body of Christ. And that is a Church that you will not find in any building. Even though when you are a Christian, many of the Christians go to some buildings and worship with other people in every kind of denomination, Protestant or whatever, and think that they are Christians, don't understand that they have been long time been infiltrated by the Jesuits. The real Church of Jesus Christ is as Jesus Christ stated in the book of Matthew, in the Gospel of Matthew, when he said, Wherever two or three of you are gathered together in my name, in their midst I will be. That is church. That is so-called ecclesia. That is the real community, the fellowship that we should have with each other. Because when we go to some kind of denomination, to greater church, to a bigger church, to a denominational church, then there's always the danger of its being infiltrated and led by people who we do not have any control or knowledge about. It's like um, written in the Bible, um, where it says that a falling away must come first. Well, that falling away came long time ago already. Some people are still waiting for it, but that falling away came. And by that falling away, the Antichrist, the man of, uh, man of sin, the son of perdition, was revealed. The papacy, as you know, it is. And this book will help us understand all that even more. So the danger is when you as a Bible-believing Christian who puts the word of Christ above everything else, and does not make any compromise to the word. When you go and visit one of these denominational churches, that your belief will be watered down by their policy. Anyway, 
<coughs> Let's go to uh, page number five and read the prologue of the book. Nobody believed the collapse of communism would happen this fast or on this timetable, says a cardinal who is one of the Pope's closest aides. But in their first meeting, the Holy Father and President Ronald Reagan committed themselves and the institutions of the Church and America to such a goal. And from that day, the focus was to bring it about in Poland. Step by reluctant step, the Soviets and the communist government of Poland bowed to the moral, economic and political pressure imposed by the Pope and the President. The key administration players in Washington were all devout Roman Catholics and some, I may add, even Knights of Malta. CIA Chief William Casey, successive National Security Advisors Richard Allen and Judge William Clark, Secretary of State Alexander Haig, Ambassador-at-Large Vernon Walters, and William Wilson, Reagan's first ambassador to the Vatican. They regarded the U.S.-Vatican relationship as a holy alliance. Well, I don't go into that very very far right now, but if you want to learn more about the Holy Alliance, then just go back to my book reading of Rulers of Evil, Chapter 1, where I speak about the Holy Alliance. And you can see the book, uh, the, the, uh, the cover of the magazine Time, from 1992, where it speaks about the Holy Alliance, a actual conspiracy between the Pope and the most powerful politician in the world at that time. Ronald Reagan, President of the United States of America. The U.S. and the Vatican on birth control, a little article from Time magazine, February 24th, 1992, completes the prologue. In response to concerns of the Vatican, the Reagan administration agreed to alter its foreign aid program to comply with the Church's teachings on birth control. The State Department reluctantly agreed to an outright ban on the use of any United States aid funds by either countries or international health organizations for the promotion of birth control or abortion. American policy was changed as a result of the Vatican not agreeing with our policy, explains Ambassador Wilson, Ambassador to the Holy See, remind you. American aid programs around the world did not meet the criteria the Vatican had for family planning. Unquote. Now this William Wilson, as I just said, was the ambassador to the Vatican. He was the first ambassador to the Vatican, I just said. Well, he was the first since the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Because after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln the American government broke all official contact with the so-called Holy See, the Vatican, because they knew, they knew of the involvement of the Jesuit order and the Roman Catholic Church into the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. John Wilkes Booth was just the one who executed it. But behind it was John Surratt and the whole Surratt family, which, by the way, for a great part, was hanged for treason and killing the American president at that time. Now, in the English version of the book, there are pictures. In the German version, I didn't find any, but that's no problem. And we, read, we see here on uh, page 6 a picture, and I will see if I can put that in the video also, the Archbishop of Canterbury and Robert Runce, uh, Dr. Robert Runcy greets his successor, Bishop George Carey, at Westminster. This photo is taken from the Press Association, January 1991, and we will later see why that is important. Just before I now go into the preface, I just want to tell you that with this reading of the book, I will not go into that hard of a detail of working out the videos, picture by picture, and putting the right picture at the right second and all the Bible quotes whenever I use them, because I hope that you understand that I do the reading in German and in English, and I really try to use easy pictures, easy videos, or maybe even when, for example, reading 
I don't know, chapter 1 in English and reading the whole chapter 1 in German also, try to do that more or less at the same time, depending of course of my comments that I always throw in there, um, that they have about the same length, that I can only make one video and just use, use the audio in it. So please forgive me, I'm not lacking um, interest in making good videos, but I just want to save myself a little bit of time and get to the point. And because I'm reading this simultaneously in German and in English, I just want to give myself a little bit less work with the video work. So I hope you comprehend and understand that. But now let's go on page 7 <coughs> of the book All Roads Lead to Rome, to the preface. The author fully realizes that aspects of this message are disturbing and controversial, and that it will be reviewed by some as a bigot, and that he will that it will be reviewed by some as bigoted. However, he particularly asks the reader to stay with him right through the end, before arriving at a conclusion or assessing the spirit in which it is written. And I have to add here <coughs> a comment on my own, where I will ask my listeners and viewers of the video to please bear patiently with me that you should not refute this book on reading the preface and the introduction or even uh, the foreword or even the first chapters, but wait before you judge until you come to the end and see if anything that I say in here is not in agreement with the word of God. Because that to me, Jörg, is the most important part, that we understand that there is only one truth, the word of God the Bible, and to me that is the 1611 King James Bible. I don't care if you use another Bible, I have expanded on that more than enough on all my other videos. I've made my decision and to me it is the King James. The point is, whether it is the King James or it is any other Bible, the Bible is the Word of God. Sometimes man corrupted it, that's why we have the discussion of King James only onlyism or not, that's up for anybody else, but still, the Bible is the Word of God. Sometimes corrupted, sometimes true, that is what you have to make up for yourself, but it still is the Word of God. And that, to me at least, and that so should be for every Bible-believing Christian, is the authority for my conscience, and is the authority of, what, of which I speak. And I try to measure everything that I read in this book against the Word of God. Most and for all, everything that the author himself says. But this preface is not written by the author Michael de Semlian himself. Anyway, continue. And I will not go every, every two sentences into a long explanation like I just did, <laughs> can assure you. He wishes to emphasize that his concern is to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace to bring together believers in Christ, bound together by their common love of truth and their uncompromising obedience to God's word. His prayer is that this book might be used to challenge faith and to bring many back to the old path, where is the good way to walk therein and particularly that Roman Catholics and other in other denominations caught up in tradition, ritual and man-made religion would be enabled to see, as the Apostle Paul and also Martin Luther saw, the wonderful simplicity of the Gospel. Faith and faith alone, no extras. Christ and only Christ, Him only will I serve. C.T. Studd, the founder of Worldwide Evangelization for Christ, WEC, who gave away his fortune and abandoned the good life in England to take the gospel to China and Africa, expressed his commitment in memorable words. Quote, if Jesus Christ be God and died uh, for me, then no sacrifice can be too great for me to make for him. Unquote. The martyrs of the Reformation chose that narrow path. They, sacrifice, they sacrificed their lives, dying terrible death, to uphold his word without compromise, and to demonstrate for posterity the simplicity of the gospel. They sacrificed their lives, dying terrible death, to uphold his word without 
compromise. That is the important message of this sentence. To uphold the word of Jesus without compromise. So when you are reading a of what is known today by everyone, a corrupted Bible, the NIV, the, NA, the NSV, the NASB, the New Living Translation, I don't know what name you're going to give it. What are you actually doing? You are compromising his word to the true word that he wrote. <clears throat> the King James. There is a need to recover the truth of the scripture so that we may all be one in him. Without love we are as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. But love without truth is wayward, lacking Christian virtue. Now we come to the introduction on page 9. As the history lesson began on a particularly lovely, lovely sunny afternoon in the summer of 1953, it is unlikely that many of the fifth form boys attending would have had thoughts for much other than the swimming pool, the cricket field or other outdoor activities. The topic of the day, the English Reformation, did not sound very exciting. And as one of that class, I could scarcely have been less prepared to learn things which were later to totally change my life. Yet what I heard that day captured my imagination and stirred my heart. It did more than that. It enabled me to obtain that what seemed to me at the time to be a glimpse of light. Through at one lesson, through at one lesson I felt in a very real sense that I understood what Christianity is and what it involves. Sacrifice and self-surrender and an uncompromising love of truth. I was not yet ready myself to turn my life over to them. Over them, far from it. But seeds were planted that day which took root, leading to my conversion to Christ thirty years later. So you understood already? This is the author writing the introduction. The history master spoke that summer's afternoon very movingly of the martyrs of the Protestant faith and of their stand for truth, as well as of their insistence that the Bible, the Word of God, not the Church, is the ultimate authority for the Christian faith. He described the life of William Tyndale, whose translation of the scripture set down the basis for the English Reformation and led to his death by fire in 1536. Light had dawned on the truth, rediscovered by Luther in the scriptures that men are saved by grace through faith and not by works. And as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Romans, quote, Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, unquote. The open Bible that Henry VIII gave to the people in 1538 was the culmination of the work of Tyndale and others and a, wonder, and a wonderful answer to Tyndale's last prayer at the stake at Vilvorde. Quote, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. Unquote. Once the reformers had the precious word of God, they were not about to compromise it. Many of those who died in the fire in England did so because of just four words in the Bible. Had they been willing to set aside these words or at least to give them a liberal interpretation, they could have saved themselves, indeed even been enabled to prosper. They refused to do so. For them, the word of God was truth and life, and therefore death would have no sting, the grave would have no victory. The four words from the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Corinthians relating to the Lord's Supper were in remembrance of me. In affirming these words they were denying the Roman Catholic doctrine of the real presence that Christ is truly present in the sacrament, body and blood, under the consecrated forms of bread and wine. They denied transubstantiation, which is at the very center of Roman Catholic belief, because they were convinced that it undermined totally the finished work of Christ, the once and for all sacrifice of Calvary. Now, transubstantiation, and if you don't understand that, go back to my readings of uh, Babylon Mystery Religion, 
uh, in one of the later chapters, I go very deeply into there. I think it is called, the chapter is called The Mass. Transubstantiation is when the Roman Catholic priest stands in front of the congregation, holds up the wafer, probably even in the montrens, and speaks five Latin words. Hoc, hoc est corpus enim meum. And by that, he transfers Jesus Christ, he even, he, he gets him to come down from heaven into that waver, into that host, into that bread, the blood, the body, the soul, the whole divinity of Jesus Christ. He commands to go in there. He recreates God. He creates the Creator. Yeah, it's only in Roman Catholicism where creature can create the Creator. That is transubstantiation. And if you do not hold on to that belief, you are anathema. You are cursed. Read the Council of Trent. Anathemas. More than 100 anathemas were spoken out. And Vatican II, between 1962 and 1965, confirmed everything the Council of Trent established. But let's continue. John Rogers, fellow Bible translator with Tyndale during the reign of Henry VIII and father of ten children, was the first of the martyrs put to death under Mary I. That's Mary Stuart, that is Bloody Mary, the Roman Catholic Queen in the 1500s, who persecuted Bible-believing Protestant Christians in England at that time. Her by name is Bloody Mary. That is not only a drink, a cocktail, no. That is a bloody queen. He was described by the French ambassador as being led out to his fiery death at Smithfield in February 1555, quote, as if he was walking to his wedding, unquote. John Fox, who you know from the book uh, Acts and Monuments, better known as Fox's Book of Martyrs. John Fox, the martyrologist, saw him as radiant of countenance, saying the 51st Psalm by the way, all the people wonderfully rejoicing at his constancy. With great praise and thanks to God for the same, he was burned to ashes, washing his hands in the flame as he was burning. Now, John Rogers was walking to the stake and singing the 51st Psalm, or saying the 51st Psalm. I think it is quite evident that we all know what the 51st Psalm is, and that's why I'm going to read it to you right here from the King James Version. Have mercy on me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, the only, have I sinned, and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. 
O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it, thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion, build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. And they shall, and then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. Unquote from Psalms 51. It says here, as he was led walking to his wedding. Well, John Rogers and all the others who have been burned at the stake for their belief in the Bible alone, Sola Scriptura, and only Jesus Christ, and not the Church, they all actually went walking to their wedding, to the wedding of Christ. Because when the resurrection comes, they will be there in the first resurrection, and will be caught up with Jesus Christ in the air like the living when he comes back. I'm not talking about any rapture, I'm speaking about the resurrection, please understand that correctly. And because we are the bride of Christ, he actually was walking to his wedding. I only hope that when the moment comes, that I will have the same faith to die for my Lord as he died for me, for my sins on the cross. And that I also can walk to the stake as walking to my wedding. Rogers was given every chance to change his mind. A pardon was actually brought out for him to recant before the faggots were lit. He was asked if he would revoke his evil opinion of the sacrament of the altar. Like so many others to whom we owe so much, he stood firm. That which I have preached, I will seal with my blood, he told the sheriff. Nineteen-year-old William Hunter refused an edict to attend Mass and receive the communion because it would be sin against God to countenance such idolatries. His confession was that, quote, he was in heart and soul a protestant and dared not in conscience attend the Mass, unquote. He was encouraged to preserve in his stand by his parents, quote, I am glad, my son, said his mother, that God has given me such a child who can find in his heart to lose his life for Christ's sake, unquote. Hunter died in the fire at Brentwood in Essex in March 1555. The burning back to back at the stake of Bishops Hugh Latimer and Nicholas Ridley outside of Balliol Court in 1555 is still well known to many people. As are Latimer's stirring last words which have so inspired Christians over the centuries. Quote, Be of good comfort, Master Ridley, and play the man. We shall this day, by God's grace, light such a candle in England as I trust shall never be put out. Unquote. We will remember them, we say on the Remembrance Day, as we commemorate the sacrifice of those who gave their lives for their country in the two world wars. For centuries both church and nation remembered those who lived and died for faith and freedom at the time of the Reformation. We no longer do so. My daughter's illness in St. Bartholomew's Hospital, which is located at London Smithfield, seen of the suffering of so many of the 16th century martyrs, brought me to the place of their ordeal. On the medieval wall, which still separates the hospital from Smithfield Square, there is a plague in remembrance of the Smithfield martyrs. The wording on the plague is simple. Quote, to the memory of John Rogers, John Bedford, John Philpott, and other servants of God, who a few feet from here suffered death by fire for the faith of Christ. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. Unquote. 
It was distressing to discover that the two Anglican churches of today which occupy that very part of the square, St. Bartholomew the Great and St. Bartholomew the Less, apparently refer not to remember. Literature on sale within the two churches tells of the Dominican friars who were living in the cloisters at the time of the fires of the, ninth, uh, of the 1550s, but there is no mention anywhere of John Rogers or of other Smithfield martyrs. An officer for both churches dealing with visitors told me that there was no connection between their church and the martyrs. Quote, they were burned outside. Some Irishmen come each year and hold a ceremony there. Unquote. This view is reflected in the religious practice or of the two churches, in which the sacrifice of the Mass is again reenacted. There is a service of communion in remembrance of me in the morning and a rite involving the real presence in the afternoon. Those who died in the fire, ironically, at a spot located between the altars of these two Church of England churches, are now forgotten. The particular significance of that history lesson at Mill High School is that at, this, that, at that time teaching on the Protestant Reformation was given as a matter of course in schools anywhere, everywhere. Today, this is no longer the case. Seen as controversial in an ecumenical climate, such teaching is progressively being dropped. In fact, a Department of Education National Working Party recently recommended that the Reformation be left out of history syllabus of the new curriculum altogether. Although this was overruled by the minister responsible in Margaret Thatcher's administration. I would like to check how that is today in 2016. A primary objective for this book is to demonstrate how important it is for all of us to remember the martyrs of the Christian gospel and why they sacrificed their lives. At this enthronement at Canterbury in April 1991, George Carey spoke of the example to us of former archbishops who were martyred. The name, <coughs> he named the Benedictine monk Alphege and Thomas Becket, both loyal followers of the Pope of Rome. So, no Protestants, eh? You probably remember Thomas Becket. If I'm not mistaken, he lived under the reign of Henry II. So he named the Benedictine monk Alphege and Thomas Becket, both loyal followers of the Pope of Rome. However, he did not mention the martyrdom of the first Protestant Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, principal author of the major formularies, the Book of Common Prayer and the 39 Articles of Religion, to both of which the new Archbishop pledged his allegiance and his enthronement. The Roman Catholic Church has canonized Alphege and Thomas Becket, of course. None of those who died protesting false doctrines in the fires of the Marian persecution will be canonized or beatified. They are not saints, especially to be singled out with spiritual merit and treated by posterity as holy and sought after in the spirit realm to intercede in prayer. Indeed, the martyrs for the gospel were strenuously opposed to such exaltation of sinful man. They knew that only God is holy. They were simply saints or followers of Jesus Christ, obedient servants of God whose deeds and example have illuminated the pages of our history. Their courage and obedience to Christ and his word challenged and broke the hold that religion and the institut institutionalized church had over the people. They brought back the simple New Testament message of repentance and forgiveness, personal belief in Jesus and his once and for all sacrifice for sin on the cross being all that is required for salvation. They knew from scripture that all <clears throat> they knew from Scripture that all comes as a free gift from God, totally undeserved, quote, and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obeyed him, unquote, as we can read in Hebrews chapter five verse nine. They obeyed him by believing all of the Bible and living and dying by it and 
for it. Such faith is rare today, with compromise everywhere. The gospel, the light which has illuminated Western civilization, has gone into hiding, and God's truth has been devalued. The leadership of the National Church has spoken of other faiths as many pathways to God and many mansions of the same Holy Spirit. The Commonwealth Day service attended by Her Majesty the Queen is no longer recognizably Christian, and army chaplains serving the Allied forces sent to defend Saudi Arabia in the Gulf War disguised themselves as welfare officers in order not to offend the indigenous Muslims. Today in Britain there is a love gospel about which confines itself exclusively to what is called the positive. It is claimed that as long as Jesus Christ is proclaimed as Saviour and Lord, we are all as one in Him. Differences over doctrine must not be allowed to get in the way of this. Hello? Differences over doctrine must not be allowed to get in the way of this. So whenever the Bible says something else than the church, well, you do the math. We can affirm truth, but not confront error. The Protestant martyrs, godly and loving men, could have taken this same position within the wider church of their day. They could have confined themselves to avoiding all controversy and to agreeing with their persecutors about many of the positives. But the scripture commanded them to exhort and convince and convinced by sound doctrine and to flee from idolatry. They obeyed. They saw the error and the idolatry and as responsible leaders, as pastors trusted to guide their flocks into green pastures, they exposed and opposed it all roundly. They could so easily have chosen to look the other way and concentrate on the many truths of the Christian faith which were common ground. They could have elected to please men rather than to please God. Had they done so, the Church and our country would have remained in the grip of a religious regime centered on superstition and idolatry. Perhaps never in the realm of religious or spiritual conflict, to borrow some of Winston Churchill's famous words, quote, has so much been owed by so many to so few. Unquote. The danger today is that in opting for a man made unity based on compromise and abandoning the Protestant Reformation and the truths of the scriptures that were sealed in the blood of the martyrs, we are heading back to whence we came. Now we come to the foreword. September the 1st, 1990, was a date of great historical significance. On that day, the British Council of Churches gave way to churches together in Britain, and the interchurch process formally came into being. For the first time in the Roman Catholic Church, for the first time the Roman Catholic Church is participating. Indeed, it is sure that she is destined to play a major role. Churches together in England was launched in the St. George's Cathedral, symbolizing, according to the journal The Tablet, that Roman Catholic Church's senior partnership in the new venture. In a real sense, in the year of the uh, anniversaries of J. H. Newman and Ignatius Loyola's Jesuit order, the Counter-Reformation, the comeback of Roman Catholicism was complete. Now, remind you, whenever I read Jesuit order or Ignatius Loyola, I read Counter Reformation. The Protestant Reformation has now effectively been abandoned by the visible Church in Britain and is widely represented as a tragic mistake. Considering the momentous importance of what had taken place, the, 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 the September event attracted very little publicity. Few people seem to be aware of the wider implications of this historic happening to the future of both church and nation. For example, although few see it, 
Her Majesty, the Queen's position as defender of the Protestant faith and supreme governor of the established church is actually called into question and her coronation oath is clearly compromised. Parliament is similarly being maneuvered into an impossible position, having now missed the best opportunities to determine its constitutional responsibility. The departure of the well-tried roots of our Protestant heritage is now apparently a fait accompli, is deeply dangerous. On September 2, 1990, a Sunday, thousands of church congregations stood together in prayer and personal commitment to one another and the ongoing interchurch process. All church congregations and all the main denominations in the UK were implicated in what took place even if they did not participate directly, unless they had individually opted out. What individuals actually found themselves involved in, and, uh, other than commitment one to another, was not made clear on the day. There was no declaration of belief or statement of doctrine. Fundamental differences have simply been set aside. That's the same policy today. Pope Francis preaches it every time. We only talk about what we have in common. We do not talk about what separates us. Go back to the video from Kenneth Copeland with uh, late Bishop Palmer, where he said, the protest is over. We are all Catholics again. We are only talking about what <laughs> what we have in common and not what yeah divides us. Let's say it like that. All the church group all the church groups in membership with the British Evangelical Council, including the Free Church of Scotland the Federation of Independent Evangelical Churches and the Evangelical Movement of Wales declined to join, as did many Evangelical Congregational and Grace Baptist Churches. Other smaller denominations that have opted out include the Countess of Huntington's Connection, the Baptist Union of Scotland, the Baptist Union of Wales, the English Assembly, the Wesleyan Reform Union and the Presbyterian Church of Ireland remind you at that time there was still Ian Paisley a very high figure in the Presbyterian Church of Ireland and Ian Paisley is the one who a few years later in the European Parliament called the visiting Pope John Paul II Antichrist Antichrist and held up banners and was thrown out of the European Parliament for him telling the truth there. We agree to differ over the things that matter most is a fragile form of unity even when there is such goodwill on all sides. It has been described by concerned evangelicals as holding hands in the dark. <laughs> yeah. yeah, like the blind leading the blind and then they fall and all fall into the ditch, right? For those that love and seek the truth, the amiable pronouncement of ecumenical leaders and the elaborate compromises of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission, agreed statements cannot conceal the reality. Unity has been established on the terms of the Roman Catholic Church. Hello, read it again. Unity has been established on the terms of the Roman Catholic Church. Who does never change? Rome does never change. Rome sets the terms and all the Protestants come crawling back under their wings. Unity has been established on the terms of the Roman Catholic Church. Cardinal Hume, one of the presidents of the new Council of Churches for Britain and Ireland, has not attempted to hide this. In his book, Towards a Civilization of Love, he has reaffirmed the Second Vatican Council's document on ecumenism statement that the Catholic Church possesses the wealth of the whole of God's revealed truth and all the means of grace. It is unable to concede a similar status to others. Unquote. Questioned on television about the decade of evangelism on February 1991, he repeated that this, me this meant bringing people into 
the one true church founded on St. Peter, the rock. Tja, that St. Peter was not the foundation of the Roman Catholic Church, you know, when you followed my reading of Babylon Mystery Religion. And if you don't know, then watch that. The chapter is called, Was Peter the First Pope? You can find that in the playlist, Babylon Mystery Religion. I cannot go into deep into this right now. I cannot refute every sentence that is written here, especially by Catholics. You have to do your own research and go into that. Peter was not the first pope. Peter was not the rock the church was found on. There's only one rock, and that's Jesus Christ. Quote, when Catholics pray for the restoration of full communion with other Christians, they are praying for that unity which the Church believes Christ willed and which is found in all its essential characteristics in the Catholic Church. Unquote. We can read that in um, Faith Alive on Ecumenism as featured in the Universe, April 1989. On the 6th of January 1991, Epiphany Sunday, the decade of evangelism was launched at more than 30,000 church services throughout the country. A novena of prayer to inaugurate the decade had commenced with a pilgrimage to the Shrine of Our Lady Walsingham on the 29th of December 1990. Alongside the decade of evangelism is part <coughs> uh, is part of the interchurch process is as part of the interchurch process is the Roman Catholic Decade of Evangelization, or Evangelization 2000, also formally brought into, be, uh, into being on that day which celebrates Christ's manifestation to the Gentiles. The original idea and initiative taken up for the Decade of evangelization, evangelization came from the Franciscan Father Tom Forrest, who now directs Evangelization 2000 in the Vatican, and Irishman Father Jim Birmingham. It was based on the vision that more than one half of the world's population will be presented to Jesus as Christians for his 2000th birthday. This vision was shared and confirmed at Nairobi in Kenya in 1983 between Larry Christensen, Michael Harper and Tom Forrest. The decade of evangelism was given its European launch at Acts 86, when the Anglican charismatic leader Michael Harper sent a message to Pope John Paul II via Tom Forrest, quote, We are right with you for a united evangelization of Europe, unquote. Five years later, both Father Forrest and Canon Harper were at Brighton 91, which followed on, uh, which followed on from one from other major ecumenical conferences such as Bern 90 and Indianapolis 90. In May 1989, a group of 100 Pentecostal and charismatic leaders representing 30 nations had met to pray for the decade of evangelism in an upper room at Jerusalem's ecumenical Notre Dame Center. The vigil was led by Forrest, Harper and Christensen, and those present apparently felt that God was pointing the way for the World Conference which took place in Brighton in England, July 1991. This finishes my first reading of All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian. On the next page we find a picture of the Pope and Dr. Ranzi signing the declaration at Canterbury from 18, uh, 1982. So I hope I could interest you in following my whole book reading of this All Roads Lead to Rome by Michael de Semlian. Here and there I was stuck a little bit in the words, but to me also it is new to read from a book, a paper back that I hold in my hands, then reading from a PDF that is on the screen. And um, because it is a book, I do not take any notes, so all my comments are not prepared. They come up right at the moment when I read them. So this finishes the first video of All Roads Lead to Rome and I hope many will follow and for all, and most and for all I hope many people will follow that reading and understand what it is all about and the even you know in English it says the undertitle of the book is the ecumenical movement that's good in German the undertitle is 
evangelicals, where do we go? <laughs> well, 23 years after the publishing of this book in 1993, today in 2016, we see where do the evangelicals go. They all take the high road. They all take the highway of the Vatican, of the Roman Catholic Church, of the Antichrist, of the Bible. They all come back under the wings of Rome. So when you want to continue on the small or the narrow path that leads to salvation, that leads to Jesus Christ, get out of her, my people. Get out of any denomination. Have fellowship with like-minded in your house, with your Bible. Study the Bible and learn from each other because we are all priests and we have only one master Jesus Christ I will not walk a road that leads to Rome how about you so thank you very much for listening watching to the video and until next time Jogler 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you and signing off. Bye bye. We as Bible believing Christians, we know that the hand that is behind ISIS, the hand that is behind Al Qaeda, is the same hand that is behind the United States of America government, that is behind the European Union government, and that is behind all the armies in the world, and that is behind all these um, mercenary companies out in the world, like XE, or formerly called Blackwater, run by Knights of Malta, etc., etc. So this is something that you really have to understand. This is all just a theater. And the point is, where is this theater going to lead to? When you are a Bible-believing Christian, you know that in the end times, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, there will be wars, wars, and rumors of wars. And we know that the Antichrist, by peace, will destroy many. And so on, and so on, and so on. I could start citing the whole Bible up and down right now with citations like this to tell you what it's all about. But I don't have to sing to the choir or preach to the choir. You as Bible-believing Christians already know that. So the only thing that I ask of you is don't be caught in their game. Because when you are and you play their game, you have to play by their rules. And their rules are not Christ's rules. So the only thing that I can advise you of is, okay, take that information in what happens about there. Pray for the people that these victims are being taken good care of and that they are just deceived people that they maybe have a chance by going through this situation maybe they have a way to find to Christ in this way maybe they have a way to find to the real truth I mean these people are Muslims and coming from Muslim countries and coming to so-called quote-unquote Christian countries of course the Roman Catholic Church is not Christian. Of course the Protestant churches today don't preach any protest anymore. All right, I know that. But still, here and there, it is possible that a grain falls on the ground that can fall on fruitful ground, even with these refugees and the whole situation that is coming up. And that is the hope that we should have as Bible-believing Christians, and that is the prayer that we should use every day when we address our Lord to pray for our enemies as we pray for our friends. Because Jesus said, love your enemies and love your neighbor.